Welcome back to Black Press USA's Fire. Once again today, we have Kathy Sledge, who is a Renaissance woman, a singer, songwriter, author, producer, manager, and Grammy-nominated music icon whose boundless creativity and passion has garnered praise from critics and a legion of fans from all over the world. Her artistic triumphs encompass chart-topping hits, platinum albums, and successful forays into several genres of pop music. It is our privilege to welcome back Kathy Sledge. How are you, Kathy? Oh, thank you for that beautiful introduction <laughs> again. <laughs> I'm fine, Stacy, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. We we know we had some some technical issues last week, but okay. everything looks looks great today. And I and I heard you did an amazing job while I was backstage <laughs> biting oh, my nails trying to get back in the room. <laughs> <laughs> we suffering. Um, as uh, Norman would say, death by, I think he said a thousand stings or something like that. It was, <laughs> it was it, crazy. <laughs> happy to be here now. Yeah. So when we left off, um, we were talking about family room um, and I was telling everyone where they could actually see it on your Instagram. Um, can you again, remind everybody about family room, the concept and, and what they can expect when they tune into family room? Well, family room, I have to say is absolutely organic the way it all happened. You know, we were pitching this, just about to pitch it and getting traction for networks. And um, within our four walls, like all of us are doing right now, my daughter had the idea of let's just start it, you know? And it's a talk show, kind of like Tracy and Diana or, or Goldie and Kate Hudson, you know, mother, daughter. And we have a very strong, strong uh, rapport with each other. And um, that's how it all started. We just started embracing people. What's so interesting is <clears throat> the brand We Are Family is such a household name. And it's really a matter of connecting the dots when we were pitching it to the networks and starting to pitch it before all this happened. And it was mainly for branding and merchandising and blah, blah, blah. But it's it means so much more now because what Family Room has become is a place where we just celebrate each other and family and especially people quarantining alone. It has been... I can't tell you the response that we're getting and that we're feeling ourselves. And we just, we can't wait to meet up in this virtual room. And <laughs> it, it's on Saturdays. I'm sorry. That was the question. It's on Saturdays at 1245 um, Eastern Standard Time, which makes it 945 on the West Coast. So I always have a cup of coffee for all the folks in LA and on the West Coast. And Kristen always has a glass of wine or lemonade for all the folks here on the East Coast. And what we started seeing, because I have a strong following overseas with my festivals, we started seeing all these cocktail emojis pop up from all the folks in Europe, <laughs> because it's it's happy hour there, it's 545. So we literally welcome people to come in the room and you just see all these amazing accents and, and people and cultures. And it's it's just, it's becoming a very amazing thing. Yeah. And we're loving it. Well, the coffee, the the wine. I'm with the folks out in Great Britain with the uh, cocktails. You gotta yeah. make me up a nice single malt scotch neat, okay? And then I'll yeah. I'll tune in. You want to know something? It's crazy you say that because we have someone on our show because lots of people come in the live and all melting pot of cultures. And one woman, her her IG name is Souffle Bombay, and she is an amazing gourmet, like. She can do anything in 10 minutes. And she made us literally, cause she doesn't, she's actually in my neighborhood and she actually dropped off a bottle of chocolate moonshine. Oh. And can I tell you something? <laughs> it tastes like a chocolate a Hershey bar with a kick. And um, <laughs> anyway, so we, we do, we do things like that. Jokingly, you talk about cocktails, but we, everything from now we're about to start the dating game on Wednesday nights. Uh oh, we look out. Oh yeah, it's so much it's so much fun. And it's also at the same time we know that it's embracing us. We you know, we weren't sure about doing we were all so upset and so um devastated with the passing of Chadwick Boswick and, and yeah. Boseman, I'm sorry, Chadwick Boseman. And we we didn't know if we should have did a family room, but we started getting messages saying please can we mourn together can we so you know i gotta tell you we had people coming in from south africa and from saudi arabia and from all over just lifting this 
amazing person up. And yeah. that's what family room's all about. And, wow. and it's and it's uh is that your Instagram account, right? It's yes. Kath Kath Sledge. It's Kathy without the Y. Well, Sledge, no, no. That's right? my that's my email. Oh, okay. <laughs> my my the the email <laughs> <secret here. laughs> That's okay. My my Instagram is, is Kathy Sledge. Okay. Um at you know, on on Instagram it's just Kathy Sledge. And okay. if you go there, you'll see it says family room in my in you know in my right with my avatar and okay so you can just click right in when it says live again i'm live on 12 45 on saturdays and eight o'clock p.m on wednesdays so, sounds good and you mentioned chadwick uh chadwick uh bozeman chadwick. um it's so chadwick um in, yeah it's so interesting because um i saw denzel washington tweet and I say that because I mean everybody was tweeting and, and talking yeah. about it, but I say that because you never see Denzel Washington tweet. And, I know like he, he stays tweeted, away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he tweeted about that unfortunate thing. We you know, did you know, Kathy, that he was sick? No, and we talked about that. And who knew? And what an amazing, resilient force of strength he was because you know, I know when he was when he was filming Thurgood Marshall, you know, we all found out later that he was in between treatments and chemotherapy treatments and operations and, you know, but he just he just showed us, I think, in the end, he showed us what resilience is all about. And you never would know. He's, and, and what I have heard, I've never had the honor or pleasure of meeting him, but I you always hear that he was such a humble, gracious person. Yeah. 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 They, I saw a lot of film of him over the last couple of days at um, Howard University and, and different yeah. places in which he was um, really just going off the um, going off script, if you will, to, to greet, make sure he greet people to make sure that he signed autographs where it was requested. And you don't normally see that in show business. When you guys were at Sister Sledge, when you guys came out, Mm -hmm. um, we it seems like back at that time we did see autograph signings more often. Today we don't really see that. Um, is that something that you've noticed uh, as a change? Well, you know what? Um, this is the new autograph, a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, no one wants an autograph as much. Every now and then I do, especially in Europe, you get a lot of people that collect autographs as collectors uh, items. But what we do get, of course, and what I think all artists get yourself. I mean, you, people in the public eye, I think the new autograph is a selfie. But what's so crazy about it is I have this ongoing funny joke that I always talk about when people ask for selfies. It's cool. You worry when people don't ask for selfies. But um, <laughs> they'll take a selfie <laughs> and then Stacy, they'll, they'll look at it and they may not like how they look. <laughs> And then they say, can I take another one? And I go, can I see how I look? <laughs> Doesn't matter how you look. But um, yeah, that is the new autograph, you know? And I yeah. think, but what I have noticed is what I like to see is, I think I think Questlove announced it once at one of his um, root picnics. And I know Lady Gaga does. What I do see more is like a lot of people, especially festivals in Europe, that they, they watch the show with their phone. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're not in the moment because they want to show you that they are there yeah. instead of instead of being there. So that is the one thing that I'm not, you know, I, I feel like with phones, I think that um, you have to make sure that you're present. Like they can take away the idea of being present. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because up until perhaps his last couple of years, Prince had a policy. You couldn't come into a concert with a phone or a right. camera. Um, but yeah. we entered a new generation, right? It's funny you should say Prince, because Theo, who works with me, who you spoke with, that was Prince. Theo was Prince's right hand guy for years, and um, I, I did go to the festival. I was a surprise artist at the uh, Essence Festival because of Prince. And you're so right; you were not allowed to have phones anywhere in the vicinity, not on stage, off stage. Um, and I get that. You know, I think, I think it it kind of takes away from. First of all, if you're as huge as Prince, you can make those requests. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I think it takes away from the, being so authentic and being there. You know, it's almost like the old saying, you had to be there. Yeah. And 
I think, um, again, a lot of times it is a distraction. I, I think even when you think about it, when you ask people to, to clap along with a song, if you have a phone, you can't. You can't, yeah. So a lot of times people do watch the show to film the show. Right. And, but that's something I just feel like, you know, as artists, we all we just get used to it. You see it a lot of times. It's to show that they're in the moment. You just want to make sure that they really are in the moment. Yeah. And speaking of in the moment, um, you got a big honor recently, um, DJ D Nice. Oh my gosh. Tell us a little bit about that. D Nice has become family now. Family, I say, as I say <laughs> in the family room. Uh, D Nice started playing a, song, a recording that I did with my sisters, that my sisters and I did years back. But what's so crazy is that particular song, Thinking of You, is actually. Um, it's as big as we are family in Europe. And I love singing it live in Europe and the crowd sings every word. And I would always say, I wish people knew thinking of you here in the United States. So thanks to D-Nice, it became the theme song in Club Quarantine, which made me, you know, I started getting pegged. I am the queen <laughs> of Club Quarantine. <laughs> like, hey, there you go. Know, very cool, you know, and, and um, it's, the thing about that particular song, Thinking of You, it is such it is such a happy song. And Nile Rogers, of course, and the late Bernard Edwards wrote the song. And um, Nile and I, you know, we we actually just did a private concert for someone and Thinking of You. It's just a great song to perform. With yeah. the, the guitar, you know, it reminds you kind of of the greatest dancer with the guitar. The guitar uh is so pronounced, you know, the um, the riff that he plays in Thinking of You as well as Greatest Dancer, but that's Nile Rodgers, <laughs> huge, hugely talented guy. Yeah, Nile, Nile Rodgers, amazing, right? Um, yeah. I always want to acknowledge, and we're with uh, Kathy Sledge from the legendary Sister Sledge. Uh, we, yeah. always want, <laughs> we always want to acknowledge those who are watching David Youngblood. He says, I love that personality. Oh, um, thank you, David. <laughs> Annette Phillips, uh, we always appreciate Annette. She says, amazing and great. Hi, um, Annette. Oh, I'm seeing everyone. How are you guys? Cedric Mil Milliner um, sends his greetings, as well as um, we got a couple of others. And I, I don't mean to miss anyone. Gina Wilson Stewart, actually. Hey, hey Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I can see some people. Oh, uh, great, great. That, that's what we want. <laughs> Hi, Gina. So, so Kathy, um, that's my middle oh, name. That's my middle name, Gina, by the way. Oh, is that right? See, we yeah. learn something new all the time on fire. See that? <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, so, uh, you know, we talk about uh, uh, Ch Chadwick and it's so interesting in this aspect. I mean, he died on the day that um, people were remembering Michael Jackson, right? Right. Um, yeah. Who would have been 62 years old. You um, shared something in common with Michael Jackson. You were often called the female counterpart to Michael Jackson. Yeah. since both of you came of age on stage as the youngest siblings and lead vocalists in a family group. Um, what did that mean to you? Because even at that point in time, I mean, they, he hadn't made Thriller or anything like that, but he was still such a huge talent. What did that mean to you? Uh, you know, it's amazing because what people don't know with, with my sisters and I, we had a different kind of career. We had we had huge success in Europe way before We Are Family. So at 13, I used to travel on the road a lot and do a lot of concerts. My, our first number one record in the UK was called Mama Never Told Me and written by the famous Phil Hurd, who wrote a lot of the Spinner's hits and, and Tony Bell. And Phil Hurd is a Philadelphian. Um, hey, Phil. Anyway, <laughs> in case he's in the room, he's so good, people. But um, that was our first hit. I was 13. And we used to literally, I used to say I had the life of a real life Hannah Montana. I would, I would go to um, do these massive concerts and we would have big hits in Japan and in the UK. And then I would come home and I'd get on the bus and I'd go to school and I never talked about it. And um, so we had these international hits and then when we did We Are Family, we were chosen off of this long list of artists, Nile Rogers and Bernard Edwards chose us. We were this obscure group here in the United States and We Are Family, the rest was history. That was the first time we ever had a hit record here. 
So with that said, I knew what it was like to grow up on stage at the age of 13 and perform for, for massive crowds. Yeah. If you, but then we did get a chance to tour with the Jacksons. You know, we did the brother sister tour and I got a chance to, to meet Michael. I knew him and I, I th to this day, I think he will always be known as one of, with me personally, someone who has one of the hugest hearts you will ever know. He had a huge heart and a, he was a bit naive. <laughs> I was I was a year younger than Michael, and I think um, I think you know I remember this now. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But I remember he he asked me he asked me a question of what was it like to live by yourself because I was moving into my own place, and I was eighteen, and I was very excited because I was you know our bus would follow their bus, and we would always right. stop and eat at road stops. The truck stops is where we would eat truckers didn't know who we were and we would eat the brothers and the sisters and i i would always buy things for my apartment from from lampshades to but to make a long story short this one conversation was one of the ones i remember most there was like dishes on the road for sale and they were like 19.99 and i was telling them you guys this is a good price and they were laughing at me and they all went in and michael stayed and he kept laughing he was laughing so hard it was so very funny to him that I was trying to get this bargain. But then he stopped, he said, why are you Why are you moving by yourself? But then the laughter kind of stopped and it was like he was looking through me and he wanted to describe that feeling. I didn't understand that then. I think my answer then was like, well, you know. But what I realized is, and I learned later in life, he wanted you to describe the feeling of what it feels like to want to move by yourself because he didn't know what that feeling was. And I learned later in life that he would ask a lot of people he wanted to know vicariously what it felt like. He wanted to live through that feeling. Mm -hmm. Now, I would have said, well, if you live by yourself, you can enter a room and leave a cup of tea and it's still there and you have your space and you have your, I would have described what that feeling meant. But I always go back to that story because it's very telling of, of how I believe Michael was. He was very kind, he had a huge heart and he was very naive. And it was only because he had a life that he didn't get a chance to really balance out. Yeah, do you find that um, with a lot of entertainers, especially those like yourself, who came up so young and was thrust into the spotlight, a huge spotlight, so, at such a young age, I mean, you think about even people like Freddie Prinze, um, yeah. there's so many of the young ones, um, Macaulay Culkin, um, you know, he Gosh. just recently turned 40, he was um, yeah. Yeah. on social media, um, teasing people about the fact that he turned 40. But <laughs> what is that really like um, for, for individuals like yourself? And, and like we said, Michael and Macaulay Culkin and, and, and Freddie Prinze and, and others, so many others who, um, who grew up. Miley Cyrus, you mentioned Hannah Montana. She grew yeah. up you know, under the spotlight. Yeah, we grow up right before your eyes. I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I have sometimes of like 95 year old come up to me and go, I grew up listening to you, young lady, <laughs> <laughs> which is honestly a huge compliment. At the same time, yeah, the challenges of there are lots of sacrifices. My sisters and I, we weren't allowed to go away to, to university, to college. You know, we, we had to stay here. And we went, we loved, uh, we went to Temple University, all of us. And I think that, you know, I would have loved to have had the experience of the HBCU or to go away to school, but those are the things but when you think about what you were sacrificing it for, at the same time, I was traveling the world all the time and I got a chance and I still do to, to explore the world in such a way that I realized how small the world is. So the sacrifice is yes. I do think I'm blessed in this respect. I do believe in, you know, I'm a huge fan of Les Brown and there, there's a saying he says, do not become what people say you are. And I think, you know, sometimes people expect me to roll, to roll in and disco. Stacy to roll it in disco pants and disco earrings. And, you yeah, know. why not? <laughs> yeah, but I think I'm, I'm very innovative. I love producing, like producing Family Room. I have produced many of live festivals and live, um, and now getting into under the helm of, I guess you could call this is very early on television producing in a sense, because we're all doing this now. But I think you have to keep yourself um, you have to keep reinventing and you have to, you can never, you can never stop. You can't get caught up in a time warp. 
I'm blessed because I think We Are Family has outlived, you know, it happened at the time of the disco era, but it has outlived so much. It's, it's now in the Library of Congress. It was registered in the Library of Congress. And so I think it's such a, it had become, it has become such an anthem. When you say, when you ask someone, do they know We Are Family? You don't have to go, do you remember We Are Family? You just right. go, do, do you know We Are Family? So with that said, I think you you have to, you know, you have to, being the artist that sang that song, I, I think it's important to stay relevant. And it's also important not to get caught up in a, in an era. You are, I did grow up on stage and I'm blessed that I'm able to still do the music that I love. You know, now I'm doing jazz as well, but I mean, yeah. you just do what you love. And I think you also, cause you mentioned Freddie Prince. I think the fact that I grew up having this, you know, very um, huge concert life as a young kid in other countries, yet coming home and being very, very normal. It helped me to have a really strong balance because I early on realized, like I'd come back to school, like I was in middle school. I got a chance to go to Rumble in the Jungle. And I remember coming yeah, home. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that, but go ahead. I, I remember coming home, you know, after like eight weeks away, I would always get my homework from all my teachers. And, and, I, and I, you know, your friends ask, where were you or what did you do? And instead of, you know, or maybe on a weekend if I was in England, my friends would say, what did you do this weekend? And someone would say, oh, I went to the movies or I went to the mall. What was I supposed to go? I was in Japan. I learned early on to say, oh, I had to work. Because <laughs> because you know what? It, it gave me a sense of a balance. And what you do realize is that I love music and it was my work, you know, when I was younger, that's what I did. Yeah. But your life comes first. And you know, one is your life, one is your work. And what I've learned is you have to know that your life comes first. So when I think of artists that live through that lens, you know, it's, you have to have that healthy balance of realizing that you love what you do, but yeah. you have to have the balance of its work and your life comes first. Yeah, again, we are speaking with uh, Kathy Sledge from the legendary Sister Sledge. This is Black Press's Fire broadcast. We uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Kathy, we were talking about Michael Jackson and I remember as when he was a kid, um, the story goes, uh, you know, the Jackson Five, of course, was hugely popular the world over. Yeah. He he flew to Australia, and as he landed, there was so many thousands of people waiting for him and the Jacksons uh, at the airport. And a reporter from Australia says to him, "What is it like to have this kind of reception here? Everyone cheering your name, but to go back to?" Uh, the States and be called the N word. Um, and he was maybe 12 years old when he, when he had that question um, posed to him, but given that you have had so much experience as a world traveler, do you think that Americans have an incorrect perception of our role in the world? Do we have an incorrect perception of our role in the world? Yes. I don't think you ourselves as a people, do we have an incorrect perception? Yes. As Americans. From 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 within, I don't think we do. I think we know that we built this country and we know who we are and we know the strength that we bring. You know, I think if anyone has an incorrect perception, it's not us with ourselves. Uh, you know, but I think that is based on fear. You know, sadly enough, when we just what just happened to Jacob Blake uh, when his mother spoke. I thought that was so profound when she said, you know, God didn't make one tree, one kind of a tree, he made all kinds of trees and all kinds of flowers. And all. And so I think the fear, if, if I'm answering this question right, because the yeah. first thing is, no, we do not have an incorrect, we ourselves do not. That is what the problem is. You know, yeah. That's the fear of embracing who we are is the problem. It's so interesting. Just this morning, I had a conversation with, with a, really accomplished ed educator, Dr. Um, Gloria um, uh, Latson Billings. And um, she said that she had a conversation with someone and um, what she said to them was, okay, let's, let's, let's do this, let's do this. 
say black people are coming right now to America under these immigration, uh, to, you know, the terms of the immigration now, say that there's no, never been slavery, never been Jim Crow. Right. Um, you know, what would your vision be now? And, and for those who say back to Africa, well, or send them back to Africa, he says, okay, well, send us back with our culture, send us back with our music, send us back with our arts, send us back with our contributions. <laughs> he says, then what you have left, you have nothing. So yeah, nothing. it's so interesting to hear yeah. you, hear you um, talk about that. So Kathy, I also wanted to go back to something, um, as I mentioned, um, you mentioned the rumble in the jungle. Now there was one of the greatest documentaries I've ever seen uh, when we were Kings. And certainly you were, um, you guys were in that documentary. They showed you in that documentary. Um, this was the huge, huge heavyweight championship fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. George Foreman. What was that experience like for um, a young Sister Sledge? It was phenomenal. You know, first of all, there's so many things that, <clears throat> that people didn't know, like being a part of that whole part of history. You know, I was I was chosen with other artists like James Brown, James Brown. So you know, uh, Johnny Pacheco, the Pointer Sisters, Bill Withers, and all of the artists were always together, and we flew in together on the same flight. So I got a chance as this 13-year-old to just be around these amazing, great artists. And of course, when I got there, the feeling of stepping on the land and the ground, I felt I felt such a sense of home. I felt. You know, even even as a kid, like pulling up when our plane was taxiing in, and I looked out, and everyone on the ground was a person of color, and that was something I had never seen as a young kid. It just that in itself may seem small, but it was huge to me because instantly I didn't feel like a minority. And when you think about it, we're not the minority. You know, all around the world, all third world, all brown and black people people of color, when you look at it as a whole, we're not the minority at all. You know, Europe is the smallest continent. So I think um, I got a sense of that early on. And of course, you know, I think I was the youngest with the whole crew of, of performers. Yeah. I got a chance to be around Muhammad Ali at breakfast every day, or not every day, but Don King, of course, was the promoter who was, right. he's, he's quite a character. You know? <laughs> uh, but I remember one thing when Will Smith did the movie over again, I, I there was one thing that they left out that was, that was huge. And it was um, the then dictator, president, but he was a right. dictator, Mobutu, um, had built this 80,000 seat stadium. Yep. And what they had expected was to bring all tourists to to Zaire at the time, Zaire, Africa. And it didn't work out that way. So here he had this massive stadium and it was completely empty before the fight. I mean, empty. And what people don't know is George Foreman, who's one of the most gracious people you will ever meet. And Muhammad Ali, who was, you know, Muhammad <laughs> Ali. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> uh, they, gave that, they got together before their fight and they met up and they said, we're not stepping one in that ring until you open the gates to the indigenous people that live there because i think the tickets were twenty dollars to get in and yeah. that's what some of the indigenous people that live there made for a whole month it was a very poor country then they couldn't they couldn't wait for the fight but they weren't allowed to watch it because they couldn't afford to go in but i thought it was huge that muhammad ali and george foreman got together and decided open the gates and when they did just floods of people. And that's what we see in the film. Yeah. You know? And it really was an 80,000 80, participant um, arena. And yeah. so I think to see that and to work together that way before the fight, you know, and to be, to really understand that is the true sense of what I guess greatness is all about. Yeah. So yeah. That, I think, I, I just feel like that was always important to know. Um, Oh, absolutely, because you're you're 100 right, um, and history has to be told in its full context, and that's probably the problem we find we find now, right? Leaving yeah, well, of history out. Yeah, and it just says it says a lot about the character of those two great men, you yeah. know. Even though they were they were fighting against each other for this fight, 
they were smart enough and brilliant enough to realize and gracious enough to say, let the people in. And, you know, it just shows the character of who they were. And I remember that. So. And what was it like to, uh, uh, we, not to belabor uh, the, um, the Zaria ex experience, but what was it like? Uh, James Brown performed, I think the wow. Temptations, I think there was- It was uh, the several, Spinners. It was the Spinners. spinners. Not the Temptations, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, um, and, and, and others, it, it became what we see now with what boxing became an event. It wasn't just a boxing match or a championship match. It was yeah. an event. And it was huge. And, and a lot of people don't remember, may not remember, I should say, that the, the fight originally had to be uh, canceled or postponed because um, there was an injury to George Foreman. Yeah. And so, so um, and many of the folks stayed over in Africa a little while longer than what they thought they would have to. It was much longer, actually. <laughs> and it actually, and that's interesting, too, because because it was scheduled to be two weeks, George Foreman got a cut over his eye and it turned it into eight weeks because he had to heal the cut, which meant all the expenses went up instead of two weeks to four to eight weeks, which tri tripled, quadrupled actually. And so that meant that the expenses were much cut much deeper and yeah. that was political. And yeah. that was something, of course, at a third, as a 13 year old, I knew there was tension with the, with the, dictator then, but I didn't know the extent of it. I do know that we weren't allowed to take when it was time to go home because Lloyd Price was there as well. And he was one of the promoters. And uh, I think we had to sit, we sat in our airplane for at least eight hours as they went over the bill. That was kind of scary, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you know, things happen. And um, these are just inside stories that happened at the time. They happen, you know, yeah. uh, but um. I think more than anything, the experience of going, the experience of of sharing the same stage with someone like James Brown or Bill Withers, a huge fan yeah. of Bill Withers too. You yeah. Know, we, of course, we recently just lost him. And uh, my my whole take on Bill Withers, I always call him. He's the the way he paints a picture with his lyrics. Bill Withers is, I always say, the the Norman Rockwell of. <laughs> of our culture. You know, Norman Rockwell paints the pictures of the history, but songs like Grandma's Hands, he just paints a picture with his lyrics and he he totally tells our culture, Saturday night in Harlem. You know, and you can you can visualize this. You can live through these lyrics. Anyway, I could go on and on. <laughs> That's okay. So, so you got some more greetings, Kathy. Kiki, the Blesbian comic is back. Uh, she says hi. hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Terry, and I'll never pronounce Terry's last name. She she uh, says, thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. We thank Kathy. Uh, David Youngblood is here. Is it Terry Schillenmeyer, I think. Ah, listen, David listen Youngblood. To <laughs> Kathy Sledge is also an English professor. She doesn't let y'all know that. But <laughs> <laughs> so. It's Keenan Maya. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there you go. And I don't know who XKS 2012 is, but hello, XKS 2012. Hi. And Darlene Thomas uh, says, hey, Kathy. Hey, Darlene. Anthony, Anthony Cousins sends his love. And Jeffrey, hey, Jeffrey hey, Garfield Anthony. says, you work with my dear friend Raymond Jones on keyboards. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Very talented. <laughs> Kathy, how was it? How did you feel? He was from the show. Oh, she did. Raymond, okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Raymond Jones. Yeah. So how did you feel when you first heard yourself over the radio? That's a great question because, you know, we had, again, we had a lot of, we had, I won't say a lot, but we had maybe four or five hits in other countries before we had any kind of hit here. And I remember Greatest Dancer was our first hit record here and it went double platinum. It was the first single we ever had here. Nile Rogers just reminded me of that because everyone talks about we're family, but people don't realize that Greatest Dancer was the first single. I was this goofy 16 year old braces. <laughs> and I used to follow Nile around the studio and ask him, you think they're gonna play the record? You think they're gonna play? And he, we laugh about that to this day. But um, I remember it was the first time ever and that's when Georgie Woods was on the radio in Philadelphia. I remember waking up that morning to go to school and the song that woke me up on the radio was our record. It was the first time that I ever heard our record, because we had records out. They just never got airplay <laughs> in the United States. But um, 
the way it felt, I, it woke me up. You know, when the alarm clock went off, that guitar of Greatest Dancer was playing. And I'm like, it was almost, I was shocked because it didn't even relate right away that that's not your tape recorder, tape recorder that we had back then. That's the radio. Yeah. And it blew me away because, but one thing I, I do realize is I have been singing what people don't realize years before recording We Are Family. And we had records with other producers from other countries. And by the time we got to We Are Family, I, my sisters and I weren't even sure if we wanted to even still sing and record. Um, so hearing it on the radio and having domestic um, here in the United States um, success mm -hmm. was huge. And I yeah. felt like, wow, finally, finally we're getting a chance to have some, some kind of domestic success. But what I, in retrospect, appreciate most is we were seasoned artists by the time We Are Family came out. So we were used to touring and singing. And so it wasn't like the record came out and now how are we going to perform it? We, we had that experience and that now in retrospect is a blessing that we got a chance to, to, pa to pattern our life that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, what's interesting is that we are family. You guys um, were also credited with um, doing something tremendous with that song, which is um, helping the Pittsburgh Pirates win the World Series. They credit you guys to this day. If you go to Pittsburgh, um, you guys, yeah. I'm surprised they haven't built a monument <laughs> to Sister Sledge because they, oh. they give you guys the credit. But what was that like? Because I, I remember seeing you guys at the game I remember you guys were in in a box. Yeah, we threw, we threw the first ball in one of the games. Yeah, exactly. And and the Pirates fell behind in that series, the best of seven series, three games to one to the Baltimore Orioles. And I just remember we are family, and and Willie Starger, who was the captain of the Pirates at the time, yeah. emphasized that this is a family. They played that in the clubhouse. They played it in the stadium. Yeah. And the team rallied and won the next three games in the, in the championship. They credit you to this day. What, what is that like? That was, I have to say, when we heard that they were using it in the World Series, when they won the World Series, we were literally in a taxi cab in Germany. And we were coming in from a gig. And the taxi driver turned up the radio. Everything was in German. <laughs> except for our song and the World Series. And we're like, wait, what's going on? And we got back to the hotel. We realized what had happened. And so the story goes, Willie Stargell, we find, you know, when we finally got a chance to meet him, he told us that he was sitting one day after one of the games by himself. And it came on, on the loudspeaker. And he said, that's what we need. We need a song. We need a theme song. So it was always his idea to use We Are Family, uh, another gracious, great person yeah. <laughs> and that you know and um they used it and it, he said that's what they needed something cohesive to bring it together to make it to to make it work and we were just i like to say lucky but blessed to, again that we were to be able to be the song the, the group behind the song um we then went to pittsburgh a lot of people think i'm from pittsburgh now i, know. I have people <laughs> People from Philly are like, why didn't you use it for the Phillies? And we're like, well, they didn't ask us. <laughs> you know? But yeah, what it did do for the record, is it for the for the record itself, We Are Family, is it re-released it. So people who weren't normally into dance music, but were into the sports world, actually went out and I was about to say download it, but they didn't download it. No, they didn't. They went, out, they, went out, <laughs> they went out and bought it. And what it did was it, it made it have a whole new resurgence right back up to number on the top of the charts. Yeah. So it was like it came out all over again. Yeah, amazing. It gave it another life. Yeah. So uh, Kathy, you, um, your grandmother, I understand, was an opera singer who taught her harmon harmonies while um, your father actually was in a group himself. Can you talk about yes. that a little bit? I'd love to share that. We, I'm working very hard now with someone to make sure that my father's tap shoes that I have are going to be uh, a part of the African American Museum. Because our father, if you Google Fred and Sledge, he was one of the first um, African Americans to break the barriers as a dancer on Broadway. 
um, his tap duo was called Fred and Sledge. And he actually, um, he was a hoofer, so they would call, they would call them that back then, like the Nicholas Brothers. And he danced in Kiss Me Kate and performed in Kiss Me Kate on Broadway. Uh, and he was, I guess you could say, early on a part of our legacy or family lineage to be a performer. My mom always used to say she couldn't, she had left two left feet, but my mom, she was always an entertainer, but more the business part of it with helping orchestrate our career. And my grandmother was an opera singer. She was a protege of Mary McLeod Bethune. Wow. She went, attended Bethune Cookman College and she sang on the gospel spiritual choir. So it's always been in our family music. Wow, that is that is amazing. Um, and, and I think people will go ahead and uh, Google Fred and Sledge. If not, they yeah. should. <laughs> yeah, Google Fred and Sledge, Edwin Sledge is my father. Yeah, and um, I want to just respond briefly. David Youngblood is asking, is Kathy really a, uh, an English professor? That's something I said because no, no. she, because <laughs> because her ability to pronounce these uh, hard <laughs> names, at least hard for me. Yeah, but, but my major in university and college was, um, uh, was therapeutic recreation, recreation for special needs. So with that though, David, this is a good point. I did take a lot of communication classes, uh -oh. which to this day, they have been so helpful to me, uh, just how you communicate with people. So, if that, so, but no, I'm not an English professor. <laughs> well, and one more, Emilio Santana wants to know, are you related to Percy Sledge? Great question, Emilio. No, I'm not. Everyone has asked that question for my lifetime. <laughs> but we did years ago, my sisters and I did some background, a little background music for him. Oh, okay. You know, you background go. parts, um, harmonies. But you know, what people don't know that I'd like to share in the room, I just, you know, in the family room, we bring a lot of artists in. We do this little someone's knocking at the door segment and you never know who's behind the door. And one Saturday it was Nile Rogers and we talked for a good hour. And Nile shared with the room that people don't know, but Luther actually sang in the background of your family. I knew that, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, I but a lot of folks didn't know. And we sang in the background of Material Girl from Madonna. And so what what Nile would always do, the B-52s, I think um, Duran Duran sang in the back of Lost, background of Lost in Music remix. So what Nile would do is he would always just bring artists in and say, hey, are you in town? Come and do the backgrounds, you know, like with us. Come and do the backgrounds for Material Girl. You know, and so when you hear that little... I'm living in a material world. That's like Sister Sledge back there. Wow. But it's pretty cool. With that said, um, we did some background for Percy Sledge years ago. <laughs> wow. So Sister Sledge did some background for Madonna and Percy Sledge. Yeah. Luther, well. Luther, Luther did background for us. With you guys. Which is unbelievable because wow. Luther. Yeah. What a cool. voice. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm a huge <laughs> Luther fan. Yeah, many of us are. There, you know, Kathy, there were so many uh, family member formed bands and groups in the 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s. It seems that there are so few now. It seems that the family group experience either drives siblings apart or brings them closer together. What was the experience for you and your sisters? Well, I have to say, you know, we had a lot of um, challenges being under the public eye as a family, our own and we, of course, we have our madness and our struggles and our differences. You know, we're people first, you know, and I think, uh, are we family? Yes. Do we love each other? Of course. Was the song written about us? Yes. Which I will always be most proud of. Do we butt heads? Of course, you know. Um, I think the challenge with us is we're under a magnifying glass when you always have to be this thing. And then at the same time, to add to the equation, we stand for we are family. We can't have any differences but we're human, you know? And so, yeah, there are chapters in my life that definitely, um, at the same time, I think, you know, especially when I went through some of the things that I went through, um, sometimes it's raised in interviews, if we butt heads or whatever. I always, I always use this line in my interview after I bring it up, I go, well, you know, now what's in your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, I get so many different responses like, oh, my gosh, I would never do a business with my brother. I love him, but I can't. And it's normal, you know. So I think 
to be on a platform and to have a voice to, to talk about differences and at the same time, unity and family, it, it is, as Michelle Obama said, it is what it is. And it's, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. Kathy, um, is there any artist today that um, you, because you, you mentioned all the artists that you've like done background or they did background for you. Is there anyone today that you you feel that you haven't worked with that you say, man, I would love to work with? Well, there are some that I'm actually working with that I've always wanted to work with. I'm writing, um, and we did this like four years ago, I'm writing with Jam, from Jam and Lewis. We are writing some really nice stuff that I love. And one is starting to resurface because I'm a songwriter that I'd love to write and collaborate with people. Um, and then I'm also writing with the jazz legend, Stanley Clark, which um, I'm humbled that he says, he thinks I have one of the strongest jazz voices. And no one's ever heard me do jazz, but I, I put together a production. I produced a show about Billie Holiday called The Brighter Side of Day, which I feel like we know the heavy story. Let's just do this bright side of Lady Day. And it's still the blues, but people say I bring her to life on stage. So I thought, if I bring her to life on stage, let's just tell the story of her at her best. Like, how do you want to be remembered? We yeah. all want to be remembered at our greatest point. And that's what Brighter is about. And, wow. and from that, I've met Stanley, you know, and well, he knows my husband. He, they work together just to, they grew up in the same city. And my husband's a jazz musician, drummer, and, and, uh, that's how I started doing some music with him. And now we've been writing together and I'm loving, I'm loving this part of my music life. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, Billie Holiday, you were a teenager, of course, when Diana Ross played her, yes. he sings the blues. Uh, what did, what was your thoughts on that performance, uh, from, from Diana Ross? Well, I remember all of us were so, first of all, we were so happy to be able to have, you know, one um, huge icon that we looked up to, like Diana Ross, portray another one, like Billie Holiday. We didn't see much of that in the early days. Right. But I, I remember I was so happy. I was always intrigued by Billie Holiday. Um, but I never studied her at all. I, but I... I Leaving that movie theater, I, I was happy that she was, that we got a chance to be introduced to her. The world was through Diana Ross. And it only made me want to dig deeper and maybe portray her someday. And um, at that time, though, I didn't really, I, I can do Billie Holiday's voice, that's what people say. And it was crazy. My aunt, I have, a, you know, we all have that aunt that lives in New York that's separate. <laughs> They're always real cool. I had an Aunt Jerry and she used to, I have all the vinyls and I used to sit there and listen to her jazz music and one day I just played Billie Holiday. And this was actually before I saw the movie. So I don't want to get it. And I started doing the voice. And I, I remember just mimicking her and my mom and my aunt were like, that's incredible. We need wow. to put that in the act. <laughs> and then of course, when I saw Lady Day, I was, I mean, yeah, Billie Holiday, uh, Diana Ross's Lady Day. I, I was only more intrigued, but I did wow. feel like there was a feeling of wanting to do her in a way, you know, we know the heavy story. Right. And that's her, it, I, both parts, um, both plays Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill at the time George Faison was producing it, landed on my lap and that it ended up landing on Broadway. Uh, but I had this, that part before it ever went to Broadway and then there's another one, Lady Day, which with Stephen Stahl, who's always here on Facebook, who I, whom I love. And Stephen and I talk about revisiting something, but I had auditioned for Lady Day and I got the part for that too. And um, they never really came to fruition. And that's what really inspired me to do Brighter Side of Day. Mm -hmm. Because I do have to say, in both scripts, it has to be, you know, we have to know the heavy. But I thought, we know it, let's just, what would it be like if we could walk back in time and there's Billie Holiday and Louis Jordan and the Timpani Five and they just propel you into the 40s and you, and that's what Brighter Side of Day is about. Well, and, and naturally, uh, well, I'll say this, I'll speak for myself. I thought uh, Diana Ross did an Oscar worthy job oh, yeah. um, and Lady Sings the Blues. 
Um, you speak, you mentioned New York Lady and I, <laughs> yeah, Lady Sings the Blues. Um, you mentioned New York, so I have to mention Beverly Roseboro. She says, hello, Kathy, blessings from the Bronx. Love watching you and your daughter on Instagram. Uh, oh, hey, Beverly, <laughs> oh, your family, huh? I always say, in the family room, we're family. <laughs> so yeah, it's family in the room. Hey, Beverly. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you're not listening to, well, let me, let me phrase it this way. Who do you listen to today? What music do you listen to today? Um, I listen to all kinds of music. We brought up jazz earlier. Um, I listen to, it can be anywhere from Pat Metheny to, to uh, some standards. I love the jazz standards, the early days, the Louis Armstrongs, the people, the pioneers of music. Um, uh, and then of course, I like, I, I love, Beyonce, I think that she's one of the most innovative, hardest working sisters in the entertainment industry. Um, yeah, okay. so I guess my, the, it depends on the genre of music, but I, I love all kinds of music. And I think that has a lot to do with growing. I grew up a lot in Europe. I did. You know, people mm -hmm. always ask, why is it that certain acts still have a longevity in certain countries and not here in the United States or not as much? And I can't really attribute that to I remember growing up or, or traveling a lot in the UK and I remember that their, what they would play on the radio would be so diverse. Like you would hear something by, I don't know, Rick James and then by Tom Jones and it would all be on the same format because of course they had back then like three radio stations, <laughs> BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three. But what that did to the listener's ear is it made it a very diverse ear. Where, okay. where we had, especially in, in that time, we had, our music was sep separated. We had the R&B, we had pop, we had, you know. And I think because of that, I grew up loving all kinds of music. Yeah. And um, I'm Well, happy. there you go. We, we asked, we recently had Wynton Marcellus on and we asked whether he I thought that- <laughs> We asked whether uh, he thought that there was an, appreciation of jazz among young people today. Do you think that young people appreciate broad genres of music? I do. I think like, it's all different now. I think, you know, there's no stuffed shirt sitting behind a desk telling you that your music isn't good. Now artists, new artists especially, can just put their music out there. And not just new artists, but all artists. You can just put your music out there and there's no one in, there's no middle guy telling you where, or where, where it should and should not play. So you have access to that. So I think because of that, yeah, I think, yeah, the market now has a much more diverse ear, all ages too. And you're introduced, you can just download something if you love it, you know, yeah. or you might be listening to a song you love on iHeartRadio and there's, a, there's another one you never heard before, but you're being introduced to these all kinds of music. So. Yeah, I think that makes the ear much more diverse. Yeah, and Kathy, you you guys came up in a time where you, you had Marvin Gaye singing "What's mm -hmm. Going On," and you had other artists and um, who who spoke about current events in their music. Uh, we we're starting to see that more. You mentioned Beyonce. Uh, you see the protests going on, the 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 um, the George Floyd situation, Breonna Taylor, um, others. Where, where does that fit in your music, in your mind, and, and where should it fit in music? It's funny you should say that because I, I had just reached out to uh, Reverend Al Sharpton right after he gave that. It was, I thought it was such a impactful speech at George Floyd's funeral. And I had reached out to him and said, if you would like me to sing with your family at the march, I would love to. And we didn't it never really we didn't really do that but i think where we are family comes in is it's such a who knew that it would be a song that would bring people together in the way that it does and i think um it's much needed now more than ever um so i think that that's if i'm answering this question right that's at least that song has left such a huge mark and, and has such a statement that can bring people, that does bring people together. Yeah. 
And and we hear so much um, now. Uh, we in addition to to great artists like yourself, we we have on um, Congress people, um, senators, and others. Um, we ask they they talk about the the importance of the census. They talk about the importance of voting. Um, yes. Do you have thoughts on that? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We I think we don't have any place not to have thoughts on that. <laughs> um, and I think. If you know, it's so important that we get out and vote, and we can make the change. You know, when Hillary was when it was running, we a lot of people felt like it didn't matter. It matters um, more than ever now. And um, I think being in the public eye, most artists, politicians, it's concomitant. It comes along with the package to be a voice to try to do anything that can be impactful. So definitely. Yeah. And, and Kathy, there's there's making music and then there's making money from your music. Some of our past guests have commented on the challenges artists face today that are trying to earn a living from their craft. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's, it's something that we do have to get a handle on. You know, a lot of early artists like myself, we're blessed that we still get our royalties for the songs that we made and the music that we made. Um, but with, and even though things are downloaded and streaming, it's just a whole different way now. So if it was, since it was, if it was before a certain time that you recorded this music, you can make your royalties. And I, I think about early artists, or I'm sorry, artists now, current artists, there's a Fair Play, Fair Pay Act that they're trying to pass. I think it did get passed, but I know I was, a part of you know the artists that went to try to really push this through congress and artists make so little they i mean very little sometimes as much as five cents a month on their music and people don't realize that i mean that the, there is no more collecting for your music and think about it if we can't make money doing what we do as artists then you're going to have to go out and get a job that you can't just write and make music from it. The music could actually stop, you know, if the people that make the music can't make a living off of it. And so I think something's got to give, you know, of course, touring always helps and working out on the road. That's where artists were really making their money. But now with this pandemic, it has hit us in a huge way. Yeah. You know, that artists can't really perform. Um, and, the, you know, like the Spanish flu, I, I remember reading about, they said it took five years for people to get very comfortable to, to come out in huge crowds again. So festivals might be one of the last things, big concerts, that people will be very comfortable coming out in again after this pandemic. Unless, of course, you're the Republican National Committee and you can gather. <laughs> yeah, mass for that. <laughs> anyway, not yeah. to get political here. Yeah, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> we don't even we don't even have to. It's like, it's like Kathy, what can folks expect coming up on the family room? There's so you know, it is growing beyond what we ever imagined, and I understand why because we are embracing each other. We're pulling each other through. Uh, you can expect some wonderful surprise guests. We've, we've got some really nice people knocking on the door, coming in. And um, we're starting something on Wednesday nights that we're, two things that we're doing. One is, I can't wait for the fall. W-E-H-I, W-E-I-G-H-T, I'm sorry, not wait, but I can't gain weight. And so we're doing this, we're doing this challenge where we're keeping ourselves accountable. These are the things that we do in family room. We, we do stay relevant of what's going on around the world. And at the same time, we just keep embracing each other and we keep, we keep ourselves lifted. So you can expect some wonderful guests knocking behind the door and um, it's just growing, just keep coming. Yeah. You seem like you have a lot of fun with it. You seem like you have a lot of fun in general, Kathy. Oh, I do. You know, it's like, that's what life is supposed to be about, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, it's it's interesting because I think that um, we had no idea the impact the family room would have on us as well, my daughter and I. And we love, we love it. So yeah. 
Well, the next time we have you, Kathy, you're going to have to bring your daughter along so she can talk more about it she as well. That. <laughs> <laughs> well we, you got it. We really appreciate it. The great Kathy Sledge from Sister Sledge. We really appreciate nice. it. Uh, we will see you guys again at five o'clock today. We will be talking with Ben Jealous, the former NAACP president and the former uh, candidate for governor in the state of Maryland. So join us at five today. Kathy Sledge, thank you so much. Everyone stay well and stay safe. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye.